Amen. All right, well, let's get into the word today. We are going to be looking at our second message. Blessed are those who mourn our series in the Beatitudes. And these outlines that we are sharing come from a wonderful church in Alabama called Church of the Highlands, Pastor Chris Hodges. And really, uh, we're excited to, to share some of the thoughts here and, and obviously some original content as well from the scriptures. The word blessing that really defines all of these beatitudes, these nine statements of blessing really can also be translated as the word happy. In other words, these blessings from God make one happy. And I told you last week that these, um, these values are essential markers of Christ's disciples, but they are markers that are counter-cultural. In other words, they're contrary to the world's value system of what it means to be happy and blessed. You know, in, in America, what we say is blessed is a, a condo on Miami Beach, uh, a SUV, uh, a Hummer in the garage, right? Uh, but but, but in, in God's eyes, to be blessed looks a little bit different. It, it, we actually call the kingdom of God the upside-down kingdom. Why? Because in God's kingdom, Jesus says the first, where do they go? They go last, and those that want to be served need to take a back seat and serve others. It's kind of flipped on its head. And Jesus didn't just talk about it. He came from heaven to earth to live the blessed life and to serve others. And so, really, as we talk about blessing, it's important to remember that, that it is different than what the world would say is blessed. And, you know, there's an island that I, I long to visit uh, I want to go there. I was talking about it with my wife. I said, look it up because I, I've heard about it. And it's the largest island in the Mediterranean. It's called the island of Cyprus. You remember Barnabas from the Bible? Barnabas, he was from Cyprus and he was one of Paul's traveling companions. You know they call Cyprus the blessed island because it is said that everything that is needed is contained within its borders. And that's really what it means uh, in a similar way to be blessed, that, that, friends, everything that we need, all that we need comes from the bounty, the riches, the favor, the blessing, the peace of Jesus Christ. We don't have to look anywhere else to find the approval and the everlasting presence that comes from Jesus. In fact, we sing a hymn called the doxology, and it begins like this. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Second Peter chapter 1, the apostle Peter echoes it when he says this. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Come on, let's read that again together. His divine power has given us everything we need. This is the blessed life. It comes from the divine power of God through a knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Everything we need for life and godliness comes from the blessed one. We have it. And last week we shared with you a message, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Today we're going to go to Matthew 5 and verse 4. Just one verse, but it has a mountain worth of truth. Matthew 5, 4 says this, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn. Another one of Jesus's countercultural truths from the upside down kingdom. Well, let me say it kind of like this. Here's another way to put this beatitude, and it is this. There is happiness even in the difficult days because we will experience provision, purpose, and the presence of God. Somebody say amen. There's happiness on the worst day because we can experience the purpose, provision, and presence of our God. And speaking of good days, you know, as we talk about blessed are those who mourn, it's kind of 
a reality check that there will be bad days. And it reminds me of a book that we read to our kids when they were little, and you may have even seen the movie. How many of you remember this? Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. You remember that book? It's a, it's a kid's book. And, and really, you know, just to have a little fun here, it, it's a story of this kid, Alexander, who wakes up, he forgot to take the gum out of his mouth, and now the gum is in, in his hair when he wakes up. And so he goes to the bathroom to brush his teeth, and his sweater that he was about to wear falls in the water, and it gets all messed up. And so he goes downstairs to have breakfast with his brothers, and you know, remember when you were a kid, you wanted the toys in the cereal box? Well, his brothers got toys, and he didn't get any, and so Alex announces on this no good, horrible, very bad day that he's now moving to Australia. You know... It's kind of funny, but, you know, our culture, it kind of has this, this aversion to, to things bad. In fact, in America, we don't like the fact that bad things happen. And even in the church, we don't like to think about the things that happen that are bad. We may even buy into this idea that um, bad things should never happen to good people. But here's, here's what the Bible says about bad things and good people. People, Hebrews, it's just one scripture, Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, Hebrews 11, Pastor Tim and I were talking about it a couple weeks on Wednesday night prayer. It's a story of some of the greatest heroes of our faith, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They're all mentioned in that story, and, and it talks about their great faith. But then it goes on to give us kind of the, the, the other side, the sober reality of, of what can even happen to someone that is a good person, as a godly person. Hebrews 11 verse 35, it says, there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. It's probably a reference to Isaiah the prophet. Church history tells us that that was his lot. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. This is the people of God. These are the heroes of faith. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts like Moses and David, and mountains like Elijah, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. It's a reference to us that now have the promises on this side of the resurrection of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Those heroes of faith did not. We have something better than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob could ever dream of, the presence of God in our lives. Now, how many of you still believe bad things shouldn't happen to good people? people, right? We read this scripture, but we need to realize that bad things happen to people like David and Gideon and Samuel and Moses and the apostles and, of course, to the Lord Jesus Christ who died a horrible death, a shameful death on the cross. Well, some might say this when they think about the bad or the evil, particularly those that aren't believers, they kind of lean into this argument. Well, if God is so good, why doesn't he just remove all the evil in the world? You ever heard that one before? Why don't you just take away all the mourning and all the suffering, all the injustice, all the pain? Well, here's the answer. If he did that, he would have to start with Pastor Nick. And he'd have to start with you. Well, I guess you're all perfect out there and you didn't sin this past week. But let me just tell you about myself. This morning I woke up and I was making breakfast for my for my family, and I got a little upset because they were complaining about the breakfast, and I said to them, I said, you know, I have to go to church, and I have to preach today, and they were like, and my wife's like, oh, okay, okay, well, I guess we'll make our own breakfast every other week, and I, and I, and I was convicted because she, you know, she was right, she was, she was saying to me, well, you should be doing this out of love, and she's right, and listen, I had to repent and say that the things that, that I do for my family, I need to do out of love and not out of obligation. I had to repent because I know, listen, we start thinking about and saying, well, God, just get rid of all the evil. Can't you just remove all the evil? We are the evil. We are the ones 
that fall short of the glory of God. We are the one that don't think the right thoughts all the time or say the right words or act towards our families the way we should. What's more, if God were fair in real time, listen, we'd have to pay for sin ourselves. However, because God is both fair and just and also loving, by, because of his great love, we are not consumed. His mercies are new today. His mercies are good today. Jesus came and took our punishment so that we would not be punished for sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we're healed. And so here's what Jesus says just before he goes to the cross to remind us about the mourning that we will face, but the comfort that comes. John 16, Pastor Susan mentioned it. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. We want to skip the mourning, but friends, after and only after the mourning comes the comfort God does comfort the brokenhearted. Psalm 34, verse 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And so if you are brokenhearted today, if you've come into this place, you're watching online today, and you feel brokenhearted, and you feel destitute, and you feel down, the Lord is here today to bring comfort to you. But friends, none of us like to go through the pain first. None of us like to be like Alexander. <laughs> Sometimes we think that pain means that something is wrong with us or wrong with God. However, James, the Lord's brother, wrote just the opposite. And here's what he said about mourning and pain. And I want you to hear this today. This is a rare place for where most Christians live, but it is the call for the believer in Christ. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. Consider it pure Joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. We like to talk about the blessing of God. Oh, the blessing of God, the anointing, the double portion. If you want a double portion, you may have to go through some trials and some pain. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith, that's exactly what it is, develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. What the scripture is saying here is that if you have not been through mourning, you're lacking something. If you have not th been through pain and suffering, you're lacking something that only pain can produce. We think that pain always means that something is wrong. However, Peter, the Lord's hand-picked lead pastor, the first church at Jerusalem, he wrote just the opposite. First Peter, verse 6 and 7, chapter 1, he says, so, so be truly glad. There is a wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. Anyone can praise God when all the bills are paid and your body is feeling well and everybody likes you. But when you have pain, it shows if you are true in your faith. If you're going through and when you're not getting the answers you want, you have to dig a little deeper. You have to trust God. That's what trusting God looks like. It shows that your faith is genuine. Continuing, it is being tested as fire and purifies, uh, excuse me, it is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Friends, a reminder, Jesus' pain and suffering brought about our salvation. On the other side of the cross was an empty tomb. The apostles' pain and suffering became the material for their letters. The epistles which comfort millions that are in mourning. Friends, in the natural, none of us like pain, but pain, including mourning, 
if we'll allow it, can be a catalyst for our growth, for our comfort, and not only for our salvation, but for the salvation of others. You see, we, we want God to deliver us from pain, but he offer, all, almost always delivers us through pain. Not, not from, but through pain. That we've got to go through to find the comfort. Like Pastor Rick Warren. Pastor Rick Warren pastors a, a mega church in California. He's one of America's leading pastors in Southern California. And in 2013, his son Matthew, you probably heard the story, took his own life. A pastor in pain. And he was trying to figure out what, what happens next. And as he sat through this time with God, he developed these, these stages, that these six stages for everyone that wants to heal after pain. And I know it's been a difficult season for us. And, and even in New York City, it's hard right now with all the crime and the, the violence and the upheaval, it's a challenging place to live. We're in pain. We've come through a season of mourning. Maybe you've lost someone in COVID. Maybe right now you're grieving someone. These six stages can help you to heal. They go beyond the, the natural four stages of grief. They actually lead us to a place of, of blessing in God. So if you're in a season, I want to challenge you to think about these. First of all, there's shock. Shock. They're all, they all begin with the letter S. And so maybe you're in that season right now where you're in disbelief. There's a numbness. There's a disorientation. I just got news from a sister in Christ that her son, a 30-plus-year-old young man, is now gone. He was in our youth ministry. Susan and I, we pastored him. And it was just before TNCC Living Free. We were eating, getting ready to come to church on Friday. And we read of a death in our, in our circle. Disbelief. Numbness disorientation, which leads to sorrow. Maybe you're in this season where you are just experiencing a deep level of grief and pain and weeping and denial. And these are normal feelings, and it's okay. But I want to encourage you to move from shock and into this place of sorrow and grieving. It's a, it's a healthy thing to mourn. And so many of us maybe haven't even mourned our losses properly since COVID happened. It's okay to weep. And to even struggle, which is the next step. This is where you're asking God, where are you? Remember Job. This is an entire book in the Bible. 40 chapters of, of Job asking God, why do the righteous suffer? I lost my kids. I lost my homes. I lost my cattle. I lost my health. Why, God? All I did was follow you and uphold your law. Why, God? It's a struggle. It's a struggle. Even the great ones struggle. But here's where the breakthrough starts to begin. Surrender. This is where we find ourselves in the struggle, in the garden of struggle, in the garden of Gethsemane, where God is asking us to go through something or he's placed us there, not to punish us, but to teach us, to discipline us. Hebrews chapter 12, the Lord disciplines those he loves as sons to perfect us, to purify us, to mature us. We have kids, right? We don't let them eat Captain Crunch every day because if we did, we wouldn't really love them. We have to tell them no. We have to tell them this is not good. We have to correct them. There are things in us that need to be purified. And so they're surrendering. And this is where we pray the prayer, not my will, but yours be done. I don't understand, God, but not my will. And now we move to sanctification. This is where God begins to do a work of holiness in our lives. This is where God zeroes in through the morning. And he says, you know what? Depression is not of me. It's okay to, be, to feel depression, but it's not okay to be depressed. I am your joy. I am your peace. It's okay to have been in pain because this person hurt you, and there's, there's a little bit of, of pain. There's a lot of pain because of what they've done, but it's not okay to hold on to bitterness. It's not okay to be bitter. It's not okay to have an unforgiving heart. You've got to zero in on this and be sanctified be purified but then it's got to go outward into service and this is where God uses your story for his mission because there's no one who can minister to someone who's in mourning like someone who's been there and come through on the other side there's no one who can talk to a person that's lost someone 
who's lost a mother to COVID, like an Angela Torres who's sitting out there and now is serving through her pain hundreds of people every week saying, God is good. I, I've been in pain, but I'm going to serve. I'm going to release the blessing of God. And, and if you ask me why, I can smile, even though it's, it's only been two years since I lost my mom. It's because I've got some joy on the inside. God's worked some things on the inside through my pain, through my mourning. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I pray that these stages of processing from mourning to comfort help you. We've got a few more at the end that we're going to share with you. But can I just switch gears here for a minute? Have you noticed that, you know, we often think what's best for our lives. We often think we know what's best. For example, how many of you that are old like me, right? You had a high school sweetheart that you were so sure, like you were so sure you're going to be with them for the rest of your life. And then you went on Facebook 30 years later and you're like, thank you, Jesus. So glad that that's not the one that I, I thought it was best. But God, hallelujah, you spared my life. See, we often, listen, we often think we know what's best, but like we say, hindsight is twenty twenty. God has hindsight. He always sees twenty twenty. God sees 10 years down the road. He sees 100 years down the road. He sees 1,000. A day is like 1,000 years. Friends, we, we need to remember that, that, that our perspective, it's limited. We often think we know what's best, but here's what God says in Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 9. This plan of mine is not what you think would work out. Neither are my thoughts the same as your thoughts. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts higher than yours. Here's one that I'm just going to mic drop on you. We think we know what's best, especially when we mourn, but here's what God says, Isaiah 57 and verse 1, good people pass away. The godly often die before their time, but no one seems to care or wonder why. No one seems to understand that God is protecting them from the evil that is to come. Wow. <laughs> the evil that is to come. That could it be that in God's mercy, he took someone to be with him. We think it's before their time, but God says, no. I love them, and I'm sparing them of what would have been a lot of pain or loss. See, we don't know why God allows pain and suffering or tragedy to come into our lives, but we do know that he knows what is best, and that he works all things together for his good and for our, for, for our good and for his glory to come. I want to just have us take a minute and think about this thought. Maybe you're in pain today. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're online. You're watching today. We're going to put it on the screen. I want you to just let this settle into your soul. This is a word from God to you. He's got you. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We're going to close here. We're going to just talk about three things before we close to help us move from mourning to comfort. Beautiful scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is probably Paul's most honest confession. If you battle depression, you're going to see it here in Paul's confession here. Probably even a greater insight into his heart and mind than Romans chapter 7 where he says the things that I know I shouldn't do, I, I do and all of that and so on and so forth. Look at this. This is, this is incredible. This is an apostle. This is Paul. He says this, for we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. Don't let anyone tell you that God won't give you more than you can handle. He will give you more than you can handle at times. Paul says it right here. Far beyond our human ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. You know what that sounds like to me? I want to end it all. It's not worth living anymore. It'd be better if I wasn't here. Paul is saying this. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, 
but on God. Who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Moving from mourning to comfort involves three R's as the worship team comes up here. They come right out of this passage. I want to encourage you to write these down. If you're in a season of mourning and brokenness, three R's that the Lord wants to get you to see so that you can move into the place of comfort. First of all, refocus. Everybody say refocus. Refocus on what's happening in me, not simply to me. This is big. What's going on on the inside? Not, not what's going out on out there. Not the, simply the loss of job or the loss of a spouse or the loss of a loved one or bad news in the world, bad news in the city. Focus on what's happening inside. 2 Corinthians 1 and 9, I'll read it again. But this happened, this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. In other words, Paul is saying that my pain is either a jail that imprisons me or a school that shapes me. Laura Batterson, the wife of Dr. Mark Batterson, she had a diagnosis of breast cancer that she received a couple of years ago. She read a poem, and the poem was entitled this, What Have You Come to Teach Me? You see, all the circumstances that God allows us to go through or that we find ourselves in are a schoolhouse, are a testing ground for God's work in us to get us to focus on what's happening on the inside. Second, second R, not just refocus. Remember, remember that God always delivers us. God always delivers delivers us. How many of you have survived the worst thing that ever happened to you? Come on. That's not a trick question. <laughs> Think about it. You're, you're here because you survived the worst thing that ever happened. What is that proof of? That's proof that God always delivers. Come on. And you were in and you're like, I don't know how I'm going to get through. And you got through somehow because God is able to, to, to keep us from falling and to make us stand in his presence with great joy. I love what Paul says. He says, he has delivered us from such a deadly peril, past. He will deliver us, present. And on him we've set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Paul Little says there's nothing that has come into our lives that is not first passed through the hands of the omnipotent God. At the end of his life, Paul says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Friends, here's the reality. Sometimes the rescue comes now and sometimes it comes in glory. But I'm telling you, it will come. God always delivers the best predictor of God's present help is his past faithfulness. He is faithful. He's faithful. From the rising of the sun to the place where it goes down, he is faithful. The name of the Lord will be praised. Friends, here's the end of the story. Revelation chapter 21. Just when you think, how is God ever going to pull this out? When you're on the subway and you're hearing all that's happening on the subway, when you're on the streets, how is God going to pull this out? Remember, there's an end of the story. And here are some of the last words from John to us as he sees the heavenly city. There are no more lights because the Lord is the light. There is no more temple because the Lord is the temple. Here's what John says. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. 
they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Moving from mourning to comfort happens when we rely on God, when we remember His faithfulness. And third, when we rely on solid relationships. Paul says this, 2 Corinthians 1.11, He will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Can I just stand up here and say, this pastor is grateful for your prayers. Grateful for the video of that guy that he sends me just about every week. Danny Pagan sends me a video, makes it puts on some worship music, gets in the mood and looks in that camera. He says, Pastor Nick, I'm telling you, I'm praying for you, brother. Gives me like a two-minute video, and I watch that video, and I'm thinking, yes, this is what Paul is talking about. By your prayers, we are delivered. I have been delivered. Susan has been delivered. My kids have been delivered because of your prayers Wednesday night, we deliver you. It's not just Wednesday night prayer. It's delivering one another. It's praying over one another, encouraging one another, saying, I got you, sister. I'm with you, brother. I'm standing with you on the most important night of the week. He will deliver by your prayers. Let's keep on praying. Let's keep on seeking. Can we stand to our feet here? Let's look in as we sing this song to close let's look in what's going on on the inside is there something that you're looking at that's become greater than God it's become more your mourning has become greater than God maybe there's someone watching the thing you're mourning is greater than your relationship with God it's time to say Jesus you're enough even in the brokenness Jesus you are there you weep with me in my tears and if you weep with me then I can do it I can do all things it's time to look up to remember the gospel that God is our help God is our provider God is our sustainer not just look in but to look up and finally for some of us it's time to start looking out that we've been looking in and we've been looking up, but we have not been serving. We have not been sharing our faith. We have not been a testimony on mission for Jesus. We've kind of been holding on to our gifts. And listen, there's a neighborhood, there's a community, there's a church that needs your gifts like Jeff and Steph. People to step up and say, I'm getting in and I'm going out. This song is so powerful as we close. It just says, you know what, I believe that I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Can we lift our hands to the Lord and just sing it as we close? Hallelujah. Amen. Well, we want to encourage you to uh, join us again Wednesday night. We're going to be back online for the most important night of the week. We're glad you're here in person, online. Wednesday night is it. We need you to be with us Friday night. TNCC Living Free will be back. If you have missed any of those weeks, come on. On Friday night, we had two hours of prayer and intercession with young people and old people like me. It was beautiful. The presence of God is moving. We hope that you'll join us this Friday. And uh, we, uh, we also have some, for those that are in person, we have a, a special little photo booth and some some goodies for you on Valentine's weekend, and we have supporting healthy relationships out there in the lobby for those that would like to sign up. Please, Susan and I also went through that with Pastor Mel at a different time. They did it, but it was amazing. We encourage you to, to write in about that to Pastor Elizabeth. And can I just have the most beautiful woman, my Valentine, come up here and close us in a word of prayer? Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's a lot of pressure. Um, but he's good. I think he talked about blessed are those who mourn. Amen. You know, the word of God, I'm sure he preached, he said it is, though mourning may last for a night, right, joy 
comes. Weeping may last for a night. Mourning may last for a night. But joy comes in the morning. Amen. You are comforted because you are loved by Christ. And so I just pray that you would take that with you. That God comforts you in our times of weeping. In our times where we just feel overwhelmed. And so Lord, I just pray that this word preached today. That the worship sang and offered to you. Lord God, would cause in us, Lord God, uh, a transformation and understanding, God, that you are our joy, that you are our hope, God, that you are our firm foundation, Lord God. And when we stand upon the rock, Lord God, we will not be shaken. We will not be moved, Lord God. The winds may come. The rains may come, Lord God, but we are on the rock and we will not stumble. We will not fall, God. And that we would trust you, Jesus. We would trust you in those moments, Lord God, where we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, where everything in front of us just seems to cloud your voice and, and your face, Lord God, that we would know that though the clouds are there, the sun is on the other side. The sun still shines, Jesus. And so I just pray that we would just be blessed this week, that we would go and be kind to one another, be kind to others that we meet along the way. Lord God, be kind, Lord God, to our family, our children. Lord God, and I just thank you for this time. And Lord, I pray for whatever team wins, that no one would be angry with one another today, that we won't eat too much, Lord God, that we would just enjoy one another's company today. Amen. Enjoy each other today. Be blessed. Enjoy God. Enjoy the fact that you have been saved by grace and that he loves you, and there's a hope in knowing that you serve a God that is alive, and he delights in you. Amen? Amen. That should just give us enough to praise him. Amen? So be thankful. Get yourself a cookie. My teenagers are already out there in line. They refused to come in because they didn't want to lose their spot to get a cookie. Lori, I don't know what you'd put in those cookies, but they're super excited and so really excited. Amen.